So people often ask me, as someone who's thought a lot about this energy and climate problem, what's the thing that keeps me awake at night? Or what is the thing that people are ignoring in the public debate about this energy climate conversation? Well, this is what's going to keep you awake now, is the complexity of this equation. But I promise you, this is the simplest equation I can do. And this is, this is pretty important. So what does this say? This, and this equation sort of was come up with really by a guy called uh, Kumi in a, in a book in the 80s. And it's grossly correct today. So the carbon dioxide concentration in the future, measured in parts per million, is going to be today's CO2 concentration. And today's CO2 concentration is, you know, 385-ish ppm, plus 0 0.55, this is just a constant, times the number, this is 0.36, the number of terawatt years of coal. Terawatt years of coal, it's a huge amount of energy. It's if you made one terawatt of energy with coal that for one year, that's the amount of energy, plus the same sort of constant for oil. Oil is 0.28 because it produces less carbon per terawatt year of of fuel and 0.2 for natural gas. Another way to express this is for every billion gigaton or billion tons of carbon or gigaton of carbon that we burn, we're going to add about 0.26 ppm to the atmosphere. So you burn a billion tons of carbon and you add this to this. That's why it goes up. Why does this scare me? This scares me because it's going to take a lot of energy to make all those nuclear plants, that solar, those solar plants, the new electric cars the new wind power, um, machines, the geothermal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, the utility of this equation, or why this is useful to you, is you can say, hmm, all right, there's a billion cars on the, ro the roads of the world today. How much you know, ppm of CO2 would you add to the atmosphere if you made one billion electric cars tomorrow using coal, oil, and gas? The answer to that, for a billion cars, one billion electric cars, and we're talking smallish electric cars, not SUVs, um, would probably add 0 0.5 to 1 parts per million CO2 to this. If we did 5 terawatts of solar energy, it would probably add you know, 5 terawatts of solar energy generating capacity. It's probably going to add 6 to 10 ppm to the atmosphere. If you wanted to build 250 green homes, like the types of green homes you see in catalogs today, so let's call that 250 million green homes. That's a, a lot, for, you know, probably enough for the whole world, green homes. And you start from scratch. That would be something like another 9 ppm, using conservative assumptions. And then if you wanted to add wind, I think it was 2 terawatts of wind, is probably another 0.5. And so you can start adding these things up. And then you say, if we made them all using coal, oil, and natural gas, what we have today, you're adding, I don't know, 1, 10, 20, a little more than 20 ppm of CO2 on top of today's just by building this infrastructure. So, you know, 2025 20, plus 385, 390, we're already up at 415, 420. We're getting very close to 450. What should you learn about this? You should learn we kind of have to, we have one shot. You know, you don't get to change the infrastructure a whole bunch of times. You kind of get one shot. You want to invest very wisely in that infrastructure. So you want to do the right electricity grid now. You want to build roads that will last for a long time if you have to build new roads. You want to build houses that will last a long time. And you want to build as much of this stuff with clean energy also. But you've got one shot and you have to start today. So that means think very clearly about what we're doing. So. It's this sort of thing that makes people who are really in the know and who've thought about this a lot think about other things. Well, what happens if we don't do this smartly? What, what are the options for humanity if we screw up? And this is the topic, and you're going to hear more and more about it, called geoengineering. What is geoengineering? Geoengineering is we basically look at the whole planet as a machine that we can engineer um, the climate of. We don't, we sort of guess that we know how to do this, but you know, we don't really know. Why do we have the impression that we could geoengineer the planet? So here's the Earth. We actually have experimental evidence. That's what scientists mean by there was Mount Pinatubo. Its top blew off and put a whole lot of sulfurous particles into the upper atmosphere. And we were measuring the temperature of the Earth while this happened, and the temperature went down because all of these particles were reflecting light back out in space. So engineers can now say we could do that artificially. 
the temperature gets too hot, we'll take big guns, and I, I'll try and draw a, a tank or a howitzer, and we'll load it with shells full of sulfurous particles, and we'll shoot them up the atmosphere and explode them, and that will lower the temperature. It doesn't lower the carbon dioxide concentration, but it temporarily lowers the temperature. There are other ideas, like for this, putting big mirrors in space to you know, project the sunlight back out, feeding the oceans with iron, and then having organisms eat it and having them sink. That may be a way to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, driving or making artificial clouds above the Arctic, that's another way. So these are the kind of radical, at the moment, kind of fringe lunatic almost, ways that you will save the planet if we go too far. I personally hope we don't have to do this. But unless we sort of heed this equation and think carefully and do things starting pretty much tomorrow, we may end up in the world where we have to do these things. Not the best idea. This is an experiment with the whole planet as the beaker. That's, mm, you know, concerning.